Hello, everybody. Those of you who watch my videos regularly, some of you may have noticed that there's a a mechanical flaw in this smartphone that I use to make videos outside. And so what you'll see every once in a while is an anomaly. You'll see a flash. And my guess as a technician is that the cause of that anomaly is a short circuit. And that every once in a while, when pressure changes on the case of the phone, front to back most likely, that little short circuit is triggered and an anomaly occurs. <clears throat> and this is the kind of thing I generally find quite disturbing. And these are the kinds of things I generally don't find quite disturbing. <laughs> because I'm a technician and, well, that's not really true. What, I'm at, what I actually am is a mystery. And there isn't anyone alive or dead especially since dead people can't talk. Or at least they can't talk to me <laughs> most of the time. Though they might speak as me. <laughs> there isn't anyone who can perfectly disambiguate the mystery. I am. Or you are. Or even the mystery that some organ in our body comprises, like our eyes which are truly astonishing developments. Or the mystery of what's going on, presuming that there is something going on, and that it's not actually just nothing going on, very profusely. <laughs> um, this is a, a not entirely uncommon suggestion or at least one way of framing the suggestion underlying many mystical traditions, that nothing is going on in an incredibly profound layered constellation of ways. When I say I'm a technician, what I mean is <clears throat> that I have adopted the role of a technician and I've adopted that role in a specific domain of my humanity, the domain of, vaca of <laughs> vacation. <laughs> yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> that would really be good. The domain of my vo vocation. Um, and those who are listening carefully might suppose that perhaps I am at this moment intoxicated, but something like the opposite is true. I've just finished uh, sitting Sazen at a pond, the one that I showed you a little while ago. It's a nice, nice place. And during my sit, um, I had various thoughts, various thoughts arose as they often do. And in Zen meditation, we are trained not to sort of pay too much attention to thoughts. Um, there are various ways of 
attempting to very crudely frame in language what one is <laughs> doing in Zen meditation, but uh, essentially the goal is to sink into deep into the sort of roots of one's being, allow thoughts to rise into part, not attempt to suppress them, focus your attention on the, the gentle arising and departure of your breathing and kind of sink down into the self. If your eyes sort of half open, don't pay any attention to what you see. Um, notice body sensations, but do not focus upon them and this kind of thing. And as I was sitting, I imagined, as I occasionally have, <clears throat> what might be required for me to actually experience Satori or awakening to the true nature of my mind or cutting, cutting off the mind road, right, cutting through mind. And I thought, well, maybe something really, really undesirable might be necessary for me. Maybe like getting stung by a yellow jacket, for example. And I saw a yellow jacket hovering near where I sat down after reciting uh, the Great Heart Sutra and the Four Vows. And I sat down, began to sit. And I didn't want to experience something really terrible. I don't want to experience something really terrible. Sitting itself can be quite difficult. Um, though when one is used to doing it, most of the time it comes fairly easily and is not particularly troubling. If one is in pain or something else is going on or one's mind is very agitated, it's not usually a lot of fun to uh, <laughs> to sit quietly doing nothing, essentially, except following one's breath with one's attention. Sometimes I would rather be engaged in some activity that produces the illusion that I'm getting somewhere, <laughs> accomplishing something. And as I sat today, there was an anomaly. I began to have <laughs> a terrible itch right here. And I tried to think for a moment, even though I'm aware that while sitting, one doesn't pursue thoughts or, you know, necessarily pursue sensations. I tried to imagine what could be producing such an incredible itch right, right here. And various ideas came to my mind. I thought, you know, is there some tiny insect burrowing into my... <laughs> into my forehead? Into my eyebrow? Hmm. Such a ironic... A really ironic thing here. This is, this is another anomaly. I don't know exactly what this is, and I'm not going to pick it up. But the idea that a plastic container like this is ecological seems to me very bizarre. And I'm sure one of those little symbols means, you know, it degrades appropriately in nature, but I'm just incredibly skeptical. Mongo kiss with Mongo, wait, Mongongo oil, lip balm with a kiss of bliss. Yeah, but over here it says eco lips. And that's sort of a play on eclipse. I just really doubt it. I was coming over here to want, because I want to show my viewers a particular um, plant that produces an astonishing seed pod. Oh wow, there's little life forms in here. What are they? Oh my goodness, it's baby locusts. 
right? There are there are little baby locusts all through here. Yeah. And they're just in this one area and there there's a lot of them. Right? If I just move some grass around, uh, I can see them, though most of them have departed from the immediate area. I'm going to be careful not to step on them. But yeah, you can see the grass is just sort of popping and bongling around. There's all these little baby grasshoppers. And these are an anomaly because A, I've never seen them here before, and B, had I not wanted to come over to show you this per very particular organism that I do not know what it is, but I find it quite fascinating. This guy right here. I have a wonderful photograph of one of these. I have no idea what it is. I mean, and by that I mean, because like I sort of have some vague idea of what all this stuff is, like living beings and I understand the categories of plant, insect, animal, But what I'm saying when I say I don't know what this is, is that I don't understand what we call it, which has nothing to do with what it is, right? Or very little, anyway. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just an incredible thing. I mean, it's an incredible organism. And had I not wanted to show you that, I wouldn't have discovered that this area is fraught with little jumping baby, well, with little grasshopper, grasshopper nymphs or um, locust nymphs. And I've actually never seen locust nymphs in here at all. I think a couple of times I've seen locusts. So yeah, I was sitting and I was having a really incredible itch right here. And I don't know if you've ever tried to not scratch an itch that really just keeps itching harder the more you don't scratch it. Um, though you might have had some other experience like maybe you've quit smoking or you've been chased when you were previously um, habitually not, you know, having regular orgasms with or without others. <clears throat> or maybe you were an alcoholic and you stopped drinking, or maybe you uh, were a heroin addict or addicted to weed or addicted to eating food, and then you just, you stopped and you could feel that, that sort of very powerful gravitic pull behaviorally toward a habitual source of relief or displacement. And when we're sitting Zazen, there are some guidelines. And one of them is don't get up, right? Finish sitting the period. And don't pay attention to, you know, little things like itches or pain or... I mean, you can pay attention to them, but don't react to them. Continue to focus on... Return your, your awareness to your breath. Return your awareness to the koan if you're sitting in, you know, with a koan and so on. And so I sat there and the itch became worse and worse. And I continued to follow my breathing and pay attention to the koan. And I successfully avoided scratching the itch. And as it almost always does, by the time I was done with the, the session, the, the little period, the itch was gone. The anomaly had disappeared. Now I've occasionally had a little itch right here lately, and I don't know why. It's a mystery. But of course, when I got up, soon after, you know, bowing and sort of finishing sitting, 
I rubbed my eyebrow and it felt really good even though the itch had long departed. And was there anything there? Or was it some peculiar form of nothing? Was it something particular? <laughs> what was it? What am I? What is this? What's going on around here? Who's going on around here? Why is all this beautiful, exquisite nature going on? And why are there humans building all kinds of really bizarre machines and boxes and shit instead? I mean, that stuff is ugly as fuck. No, it's much uglier than fuck. Um, it's just wrong somehow to me. But um, my point really is more about mystery because what's actually going on around here is fundamentally mysterious. And I mean the sort of punny version of that word where we focus on the dementally <laughs> and even the fun fundamentally um, mysterious. Last night, when I came home, I turned on my computer, which has an LCD screen. It's very advanced, even though it's now a number of years old. And I could see, crawling around on my computer, a very, very tiny insect. And I realized from the shape of the insect, being someone who's fascinated by insects, that it was either some form of mite or it was a very tiny, extremely tiny, tick larva. So, I didn't want it to get away. Language is so funny. <laughs> I did not wish it to receive a path. <laughs> I did not wish it to get away. <laughs> um, I'm just scooping around. So I tried to conceive of a method. It could move relatively quickly for such a tiny thing. And when I say tiny, what I mean is perhaps the uh, perhaps a, a quarter of the size of a flathead pin, right? That we might use in sewing to hold fabric together prior to it being hemmed. I'm going slow so that the robin doesn't have to fly away in order to avoid me. Because we're kind of taking a little walk together. So I tried to come up with a method whereby I could reliably obtain this creature, capture it, and I know of a variety of methods, um, but I decided to settle on using a sheet of paper in an attempt to cause it to fall onto the sheet of paper off of the monitor. <clears throat> I 
it was at that point that I realized that this very tiny and relatively troubling anomaly <laughs> wasn't on the surface of the monitor. but was somehow between the display and the glass surface that separates the display inside the case from the surface of the glass. And that caused me to wonder if perhaps what I was seeing wasn't an organism at all, but was instead a piece of code, right? That I was seeing, was I possibly seeing code, a virus or a piece of malware or a little program that was intended to deceive me into believing there was an insect on my computer. And then it took a shit. <laughs> a very, very tiny shit, because if <laughs> you can imagine how incredibly minute that poop was. Um, but I saw it happen. And I have various magnifying glasses and loops and little handheld microscopes and so on. Um, I couldn't get it under the microscope, which would have been cool, but I did get a good look at it with the magnifying glass, a number of them. And it was quite clear to me that I was looking at an actual organism, not in fact, an algorithm. Some people, perhaps Richard Dawkins and other people similar to him, will suggest that organisms and algorithms are a very similar phenomenon. And I will suggest that they are catastrophically mistaken. For a number of reasons, not the least of which being that... Sorry, I've got some... From my little traipsing in the grass, I've acquired some... Uh, <laughs> some hitchhikers. Huh? In this case, seeds that are poking my ankle. Hmm, this one really doesn't want to come out. I may have to bear with it. And you with me. So there was another anomaly and a rather troubling one because I wanted to know where does a, how is it, first of all, mites are apparently not visible from the naked eye, which means that everything, as far as I could tell, everything that looks like a mite is probably a tick. And I wondered why, I had all kinds of questions, why would a baby tick be inside my computer? Um, do, are there ticks in my house? You know, all these kinds of questions, right? But there wasn't anything I could do about the tick and I wanted to be careful not to squash it because otherwise it would become a permanent fixture on my monitor. And one of the, one of the bizarre, one of the queer, not in the sense that's usually used sexually, but in the sense of peculiar, one of the queer aspects of my persona is that I'm something of a perfectionist. And this is part of why I ended up becoming a technician. Um, it was because I was a little bit anal about ensuring my computers were functioning perfectly. If only I had been as concerned about my intelligence or the physical health of my body, things might have turned out very differently in my life. Um, but I became a technician and for a long time I made a really good living at it. These days, not so much. Uh, hmm. 
Now, yesterday I was on a phone call. And yes, I, I, am, I am going somewhere, however circuitous my route. I think in um, British English they say route. I wonder if those might be the plant that my friend Ryan was referring to as bachelor's buttons. I'm not sure. There's a lot of hummingbirds here and I love them. They're amazing. I also love bats and martins. And I kind of think of martins as the bats of the daytime and swallows because they're similarly acrobatic. Um, and, and it just occurs to me for the first time in my life just now that perhaps bat is short for acrobat. <laughs> because if you've ever watched bats closely <clears throat> in flight, you'll, you'll be aware that their capacity for incredible, oh, there's a Martin, for incredible feats of aerial acrobatics with unimaginable precision is profound. I'm at the frog pond hoping to hear some plops, the plops of frogs attempting to evade me and hearing my steps on the little wooden bridge. So far, no evidence. This is parrot weed, apparently, a common um, supposedly invasive form of vegetation that is often the result of having someone emptying a aquarium into a pond. This parrot weed has been here for a very long time and is sometimes cleared out and almost always grows back. No plops today. I am sure there are frogs there though. That's the main pool in which there are frogs in the park. So a couple of other anomalies yesterday, I was on the phone with a friend painting uh, an analogy that I call the Genji lamp, which is a toy I learned when something that I think of as an angel was teaching me long ago for a number of months. <laughs> One of the most ecstatic, the, perhaps the most ecstatic time and experience of my life and an extremely anomalous one. <laughs> and there were a number of very significant anomalies that happened that led up to that experience, anomalies that occurred in the in the pre-penumbra, right, in the in sort of pre-dawn light of this really profound mystery. But yesterday, I saw a beetle during this phone call walking quickly along the ground, and it was dragging something behind it that at first glance I thought might be its own guts. I thought, oh, I've seen things like this before where a creature is badly injured and it's dragging its own entrails after itself. Um, so I took a few photos of that for later. Ooh. Yeah. I'd love to be able to emulate the sounds of birds. Wow. Such a powerful sound. lucky there.
Here's the yellow jacket nest. I inadvertently stood right on top of the other day. turned out what the beetle was dragging along behind itself wasn't its entrails, thankfully. And this is, though I'm meandering, you're going to find an interesting thread if you follow my trail here. It was dragging its own mold. So insects have exoskeletons, and many of them molt. And when they do so, they often are very vulnerable for a short period of time, hopefully short, although sometimes as long as 24 to 48 hours they are still, and they break out of their skeleton, their external skeleton, and then you'll see the molt, for example, of the mayfly or um, damselfly larva or dragonfly larva, or you'll see the chrysalis of a caterpillar, or you'll see the um, fluffy cocoon of a moth. <laughs> they, um, you know, you'll see the, the the shed skin of a snake, or perhaps a lizard. So what the beetle was dragging, the beetle was fine, it had molted, and actually I could tell it was really healthy when I looked at it, so even though I was concerned that it might be dragging its own entrails around, it seemed pretty unlikely because the thing just looked extremely vital to me. And I determined later that what it was dragging around was its molt, and that the molt hadn't fully separated from the end of its abdomen which, of course, it will do in time. However, the, the beetle's a little more vulnerable dragging its molt around with it. And one of the great mysteries of humanity is that it is my perspective and my experience that we also undergo something like molt phases. There are a number of life phases for the human being. We each undergo them. There might be multiple ways to molt as human beings, but most of them are internal, even though we recognize the difference between an infant, a child, a teenager, a young adult, an adult, a, a middle-aged person, a person achieving old age, and a very, a very elderly person. But I think there is another aspect to our humanity and perhaps to other living beings, an interior aspect that also undergoes, undergoes molting. And this is a great mystery. This is an incredible mystery. But that wasn't enough yesterday because moments after photographing the beetle, a coyote came down the hill and walked directly toward me, as though it was gonna walk right up to me. I'm just standing there watching it and I'm thinking, is this coyote actually gonna walk directly up to me? And I guess maybe, I mean, you know, a reasonable ways away from me, but for a while I was starting to get a little confused because I thought, it's not likely that coyotes are gonna just walk right up to me in, in, in daylight. Um, and, I, and I know the coyote was coming down from its its den, because I was up on the side of the mountain where I know there are coyote dens. And coyotes would certainly, I think, prefer to be um, creatures that are associated with a pack rather than lone, uh, urban coyotes that I think have a bit of a harder time. Packs can distribute risk and opportunity among the members in ways much like my hand has a number of fingers, right? This would not be as useful if it were just a club, right? A one, 
one appendage. So the coyote approached me and I'm fascinated by coyotes and I was looking right at it and I was standing very still and then eventually it noticed me and sort of veered off and you know ran up the hill. And that wasn't incredibly mysterious because I know that there are coyotes here and yet it's very uncommon that one essentially like looks at me, looks directly at me and is walking directly toward me. And it was a small animal, I wasn't afraid of it. Um, but I was curious and I was fascinated and I love coyotes, so I love to see them. I was happy, I was pleased. Now I've been fascinated by anomalies since I, since I was a little child and I realized very quickly that <laughs> the stories that the adults told themselves about the world and organisms and life on earth and the mysteries of dreaming and waking and consciousness were quite confused and in many cases based on ideas that were senseless or overtly wrong. <laughs> so for example, they thought that all dreams were just dreams, not true. They thought that insects were disposable pests that should be exterminated, extremely untrue, unless you think the organs of your own body should be exterminated. Um, they thought that to find life from space, you'd have to go to other planets, untrue. All the Earth here is life from space. This is a planet absolutely teeming with space life because there isn't anywhere else for life to come from. So if you're interested at all in life in space, you should be very, very interested in terrestrial life because all of it comes from space. <laughs> Earth is a planet in space. All this stuff, these are what the humans want to think, you know, aren't aliens, but they are. And particularly the insects and animals and anciently evolved intelligences from which we derive our own humanity and upon which we thrive, on the backs of whom we've risen to what appears to be a kind of dominance but is very conflicted and there's another mystery there. Why would the dominant animal, if there is a dominant animal, and by dominant we mean certain things, I mean certain things, I mean one who has the capacity to both shape and to shape nature to its own ends and to uh, control it and examine it and rationally understand aspects of its activity and organismal nature and origin, biology, all these things. So from a very young age, I realized the, the adults were quite confused. But I also felt many strange longings and urges for which I found no answer or correlate in human culture. I still do. And so I became a student of living beings and I knelt before the ant, I knelt before the paramecium, the amoeba, the protozoa, the snail, the slug, the frog, the toad, the lizard, the snake, the blue jay, the bee, the wasp, the beetle, the sow bug, the caterpillar, the butterfly, the dragonfly, the moth, And when I say I knelt, what I mean is I looked up to them instead of overlooking them. I developed the intention to understand life rather than to overstand it. And however imperfectly I practiced that intention, 
thoroughly encouraged and punished by the culture and people around me for doing so, encouraged by their ignorance and punished by their strange desire for conformity, I continued to pay very close attention to anomalies. And as a very young man, I read books like Future Shock, Chariots of the Gods. There was an author named Colby who worked for the, for the military, who wrote lots of books in the library. And I was fascinated by technology and the possibility of a technological utopia, which <clears throat> was a common fairy tale when I was a youth. And I was fascinated by automobiles and jets and missiles and rockets and space flight and science fiction and bombs and the human technological imperative seemed to me a stairway to utopia. So you can imagine how confused I was when at last <clears throat> it finally dawned on me that I had that backwards. And I think it was around the time that I started really studying computers that I began to realize, like, I think we got something wrong going on here, but <clears throat> I'll return to that. Though I'll, I'll mention, in case I don't, that what I immediately realized was that organisms outperform computers in ways we are ill-equipped to completely penetrate and probably will remain that way forever. Maybe I'm just singing the song of my hope. In any case, when I was little, it was as if I had come to human life from another age, from an ancient age in which things like butter knives and forks and zippers and hems and shoes and televisions and telephones and wristwatches and automobiles and guns and, and you know, latches and, and screws and drills and all these things were impossible because I could not make any of those things. I couldn't make the simplest thing in our home. I couldn't make a button. You know, So where, I, th I wondered, did all these things come from? And of course, back then, I didn't even know where meat came from. Or, or really what it was. We just ate it. It tasted good. <laughs> I remember when my mom tried to explain to me where meat came from. I thoroughly did not believe her. I had to go to the butcher, right? Snuck away from my mom at the grocery store. Went to the butcher, who was kind of my friend, right? He would give me a hot dog cold hot dog every time we saw him and he liked my mom my mom was very beautiful lots of guys liked her and I didn't know what that was about I didn't I just thought like people were friendly <laughs> I didn't realize mm, the guys weren't just being friendly they really liked my mom so I went to the grocery store and I I asked my I asked the butcher you know about what my mother had told me. I asked the butcher where the meat came from. And the reason I didn't believe my mom wasn't because she was, you know, habitually lying to me, but sometimes she would sort of play with me, right? I remember when she told me that Y-O-U spells you my same problem, I thought, like, you're just making that shit up. That's not possible. You adults are crazy in the head about language. And what I heard was why, oh, as you know, in the Shakespearean O, oh, right? Why, oh, you. Like, I heard a question in the spelling of a word. Why, oh, you. So I couldn't believe her. And there was an anomaly. The butcher told me where the meat came from. And I was inconsolable. 
but I was also addicted already. Not just to meat, but to the ceremonial ritual of dining with my family. Something I then could not abstract from experience because it was so embedded that I couldn't take it apart, right? And say this is uh, this or that. But when I was little, I thought there was actually uh, some, some other species of humans that, did, that made the things. <laughs> because you can't make a wristwatch. There was one of those flashes, did you see it? <laughs> you can't make a wristwatch. I mean, yes, of course, today you can buy all the components because they've been manufactured. But, but what I mean is, you can't, it, it would be extremely difficult to, to, to manufacture all those components by hand. And like a zipper is unimaginably sophisticated and incredibly functional thing. It just doesn't, it didn't make any sense. So when I was little, it was as if I had come from another age where I still had the memory that these things all around us that we take for granted, I mean, had television? Are you fucking kidding me? Like that just doesn't make any sense at all. How the fuck do you encode signals in radio waves that become pictures somewhere else? It's insane. I still don't understand it. And I'm a technician, like I know how computers work, in theory. Whether I could assemble one myself, you know, I doubt I could build a hard drive. Um, or, you know, RAM chips, or ROMs. But I can code, a bit. So everything around me just seemed impossible, and I thought, like, where are all the people who make all the things? And I was a child, so I didn't know that there were factories and, you know, manufacturing plants, and they sort of pieced out the functional aspects of producing the parts and then there were <clears throat> usually other places where the parts were assembled into holes and so on and so forth. But this is entirely unlike nature, by the way. Nature does nothing like that. I mean, unless, unless we call the parts molecular chemistries, right? In that case, then different plants and microorganisms and some insects and some animals and so on and so forth. We produce complex molecular chemistries and there's are shared around and um, it, it makes shortcuts for everything. And what you, what you eventually discover is that all of life is like that seed in my sock. It's hitchhiking on each other. And now you have something really interesting. Once you notice this anomaly that everything's hitchhiking on each other, you can begin to wonder about the nature of your own consciousness. And you can wonder, for example, and this is a very dangerous question, because it could lead you to a direct experience of some of the answers, and there are more than one. There's more than one answer. Are our minds hitchhiking on something so astonishing that we have never conceived of it, even though we have myths about it? And I'm not going to answer the question for you because that would be cheating. <laughs> and even in the answers I could present, there'd be not only a goodly quantity of mystery, they might be almost pure mystery. I remember some time, a long time ago, when people who trusted my, my sleuthing abilities, which while not perfect, aren't bad, um, I remember uh, someone describing an extremely strange event that happened in their backyard at night with weird noises and things being thrown around and big shadows. And As someone who's been fascinated by anomalies my entire life and particularly I'm very, very curious. And I come from way before this was a cult, right? Nowadays, it's like, it's sort of part of pop culture. But um, I was extremely curious about UFOs and the possibility of aliens because I had become convinced that my species wasn't actually intelligent. And as a group, I maintain that bias. <laughs> and so what I was hoping was that it might someday be possible for me to meet another species that was actually intelligent. Now, of course, I recognized that 
the hymenopterans and, you know, the dog packs and the dolphins and the whales and the octopuses and the squid and the cuttlefish and all these creatures, the, the praying mantises, these are intelligent organisms. Jumping spiders are curious about human beings, and you can't be curious about giant monsters unless you're intelligent. <laughs> um, in fact, curiosity about giant monsters, like humans, gets most things killed. So the fact that there's much of that at all in nature is very surprising. And I think indicative of a mystery. But back then, so I've studied anomalies and mysteries my entire life. I've been very interested in the things that don't fit expectations. The outliers, the prodigals, the hermits, the strange ones, the forgotten ones, the outsiders, the real outsiders, not the people who put on the t-shirt, the actual stuff. And that fascination paid off, but it continues to pay off. Even though most of what I wonder, I still wonder. I just wonder more deeply and from a more informed perspective than I started out with. Um, <laughs> but in any case, someone once asked me, and I've I've experienced, you know, relatively extreme anomalies on a number of occasions in my life. Um, I once saw what people refer to as a fireball, and that was one of the most terrifying and astonishing things ever. Terrifying because first, at two o'clock in the morning in Stockton, sometime in the early 1980s, on a Saturday night, everything lit up ten times brighter than daylight and I felt heat on the back of my neck. And back then, the most reasonable supposition for the cause of such a situation was that a nuclear warhead had gone off. My friend, Ray Latham, on the other side of the tree, began swearing inveterately. Holy shit, motherfucker, and just, and he, he was looking at the, he was looking in the direction from which the phenomenon, you know, was affecting us. And I didn't want to turn around and see, you know, like a mushroom cloud or something or just blinding white light. So I waited, I don't know, what seemed like a long time. I was expecting to die. I just, I didn't need to see what was going to kill me. I was just like, okay, we're, we're done. It's over. I don't need to know. But when I finally did turn around, <clears throat> Uh, what Ray was observing was a slowly descending ball about the size of a full moon that, that seemed partly transparent, um, light blue, with flames slowly flickering around it in a penumbra, mostly on the top, slowly, slowly descending with slowly flickering flames. Not a meteorite. Nothing like any phenomenon I'd ever seen. And it was so damn bright that everybody for 50 miles should have been like, holy sh... you know, should have been calling the news stations. We couldn't find a single person, even people who were out cruising on the avenue at the same time of that night. No one knew. But four of us saw it together. And we don't know what it was. It was a fireball. We have a word. But in any case, someone once asked me a complex question, you know, what do you think? They gave me the description of a situation in their backyard late at night. And I, and I actually had the presence of mind to ask them, did it ever occur to you that some things are inherently mysterious and that it might be, in some cases, wise to just stay with the mystery of the experience or the event and not try to disambiguate it, not subject it to the courtroom of, of the, the category machine, the, the, the knives that cut 
phenomenon into categories so familiar to the grasping hand of the waking mind. It wants to know what things are and it thinks. It suspects those identities are inherent in the things rather than its activity. And I tell you, my friend, if I may call you that, that this is a mistake. This is largely backwards. It is the activity of the mind that distinguishes, that disambiguates from a cloud-like, essential nature in the domain of identity that distinguishes and separates and isolates and categorizes and says what a thing is. And then once we, once we think we know the what, right, we can then like collect or dismiss or commodify or negate or excuse or explain or diagram. And we produce a bunch of representational behavior therefrom. Now, it's not too hard to understand why we want to do something like that, what the utility of it, the pragmatism of it is. so happy when I'm not in a box staring at a screen, even though I'm staring at a box with a screen in my hand. <laughs> I'm not in a box staring at a screen. But it's, it's okay, because I'm, you know, we're sharing. From one perspective, all these life forms are evidence of a great mystery. My eyes and the capacity to speak, language itself, our entire array of knowledge, the high-pitched chirp of the hummingbird, the unheard noise of infrasound, the scent of the Brugamensia, the Tura, I mean, if this doesn't look like space life, nothing does. All of these are mysteries. But I've spent my life chasing anomalies, and I'm fascinated by the sciences. Perhaps of all of them, biology, microbiology, molecular biology, immunology, neuroscience, to a lesser degree chemistry, um, physics and mathematics, all these things fascinate me. And I have some familiarity with each of them, although unfortunately I, I never, being self-educated after the age of about 11 or 12, um, I never became uh, properly you know, trained in mathematics, though I made a couple of attempts here and there. One of which was interrupted by a siren. <laughs> and a young Norwegian woman who declared her insane passion for me and, <laughs> and ended my, my, my second attempt at mathematical training with my fascination for her. Um, <laughs> of course, I blame her. I made the choice. But um, my point is I didn't pursue math far enough to like, get to calculus and beyond, which I really need, needed to do if I were to understand some of the deeper questions in physics, though I'm capable of approaching many of the questions without having to formalize them explicitly. Um, but if I had a little wish, a small one, I might wish to be educated enough to understand 
at least as clearly as the author, his book, The Road to Reality. by Roger, Sir Roger Penrose. The sciences fascinate me. Our, our supercultures and corporations use them to very dangerous and lethal effect. I hold in my hand at the moment more computing power than, than probably existed on Earth in 1964. What do we do with this incredible endowment? We use it to, to be surveilled <laughs> by corporations for, the, for, for what primary purposes, too? Um, the ostensible purpose is advertising. Oop. Almost dropped my camera. It's very uncommon that I, that I do that. I called it my camera, too, which is not very common, except I was nervous. Um, but the other purposes are far more nefarious. The purposes of psychography that underlie the capacity to directly control our thought, metabolism, biology, social relationships, intelligence, capacities for nation making, and so on. But I remain a student of anomalies. I look for that tiny little feature that hides a hint so often overlooked that it distorted the course of what otherwise might have been prodigious discovery. Or, perhaps even more profoundly, contact with non-human intelligence. Now, the ancient peoples had protocols for this. And some very few of those protocols continue to exist today. However, the scientists believe those protocols to be superstitions. How unfortunate for them. They've overlooked something fundamental about the nature of being itself, the nature of consciousness, the nature of intelligence, and in fact, the origins of their own disciplines. They've overlooked communion unity. They've overlooked the idea that everything is hitchhiking. Everything. And it's not the only metaphor, but it's an awfully fucking good analogy of what's going on. The remora hitchhikes on the shark. <laughs> Our complex consciousness hitchhikes on the metabolic activity of 40 trillion microbes. <laughs> the cells that compose our bodies. One might even imagine that bacteria assembled animals the way humans assemble spacecraft to travel together in super colonies and to develop senses and orders of sensing that were so astonishing compared to what the bacteria had by themselves that they might as well comprise science fiction. And when I look at this, or this, or this, and these, or this, or even this stuff, right? I am aware <laughs> that we might be the, sci the accomplished science fiction of our own microbiota. Anomalies are fascinating to me, and they always will be. But it's also useful, rather than chasing an answer, to preserve the mystery, because there's something fundamentally mysterious about the nature of communion in and as nature. And when you throw that mystery away, the remnant is deceptive, oh scientists. So keep the mystery. Keep it close at hand. Revere it. Get to know it. Make friends. My favorite answers are not conclusions. They are reframings of the question I adore. 
that I am chasing through time space in my life and dreaming, in my heart and thought, in my art and writing, in my reverence and adoration, in my passion. The great mystery of being. in which we may participate in ways both unimagined and surprising, in ways that relieve us of our cynicism and certitude, our overstanding of knowledge whether or not the stories in Genesis emerge from the fact of a divine intelligence within and surrounding and perhaps beyond nature and thought, the idea that knowledge is deadly, pay attention to that hint. It won't kill you outright just as the snake, well, the serpent, it's a much more complex idea. Was, was there a flash there? <laughs> just as the serpent implied, it, it won't kill you outright. The serpent was very lawyerly <laughs> in its, uh, its interview with the primordial feminine It won't kill you outright. But if you're not careful, your soul can suffocate in its armor. So be careful. Make a place for reverence, for adoration, for wonder, for awe, for mystery, for revelation. And know this, the humans, for all the hubris of our species, what we actually understand is mostly wrong, not in the sense of being incorrect within its own axiomatic system. Within its own axiomatic system, it's correct. That's no, that's no great feat. In the sense of representing insight, like the little flashes that happen in my smartphone when that circuit I know nothing of shorts out briefly under pressure. Bye-bye for now.